Um, I really want to accomplish three things tonight. Um, first, I want to explain, um, to give you a better understanding of some of the complex financial products that are really at the heart of this crisis, and, are, and really what caused this crisis. So one is understanding financial products, um, the complex securities and derivatives that um, are being talked about in the media but are not widely understood. Number two, to talk about how the crisis actually started. Number three, to talk um, and about my own ideas and my own research to explain a little bit more about why the crisis happened, where regulators were, what they were doing and what they weren't doing, and one of the main factors that helps explain the crisis. Um, I may not get fully into all of my own research in part three, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me in the Q&A. Um, so part one, understanding the financial products at the heart of the crisis. Um, there's really two complex financial products that really were um, heavily involved in the crisis. One is what are called mortgage-backed securities. Second is what is called credit default swaps. So what I'm going to do is sort of walk you through the basic economics of both of these financial instruments. And then that will lead to part two to explain how the crisis began and how mortgages all the way here started affecting financial institutions here and throughout the chain later, basically how mortgages in cities and small towns across America led to the collapse of institutions, of financial institutions from Wall Street to Iceland to beyond. It's a pretty complicated story, but I think if we walk through step by step part one and two of my talk, I hope it'll make a little bit more sense. So let me start with just a basic explanation of how mortgages work. You all know this, it's pretty simple. A mortgage is basically a lender giving someone who wants to buy a home money in return for an IOU. This has been going on for hundreds of years. There's nothing particularly fancy about this at all. Now, when a mortgage lender lends to a borrower, or when any lender lends to a borrower, there's essentially going to be some credit risk. What that means is that the lender may incur losses or has a certain probability of losing money if the borrower doesn't repay. Now, this traditional setup has worked for quite a long time in the US and abroad. But there's certain drawbacks for the mortgage lender with this basic setup. So let's talk about a mortgage lender in Albuquerque. A mortgage lender in Albuquerque is going to have a lot of credit risk concentrated in one particular area, right? If there's massive defaults in Albuquerque or if people start not paying their mortgages or their other loans in Albuquerque, that mortgage lender is going to be heavily at risk. Second, so the first thing is that there's a concentration of risk. That's the first problem for the mortgage lender. The second problem is that there's going to be an asset and liability mismatch. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that mortgage lenders, if you think of them as banks, are going to have a lot of short-term liabilities. People who deposit their money at a bank are going to have the, uh, generally going to have the right to withdraw their money anytime they want. That creates a short-term liability. These IOUs, this right to future money from the borrower, is a long-term asset. It will be paid over many years, 15, 30 years. 
This mismatch between having short-term liabilities and long-term assets puts even more risk on the lender. So one, credit, the concentration of credit risk. Two, a mismatch. Three, both of those two initial factors are going to play into how the accounting statements of the lender, what they look like. Investors who are considering investing in the lender or creditors who are considering giving money to the lender are going to look at the balance sheet of the lender. And they're going to see that there's an excessive concentration of risk. They're also going to see that there's a lot of short-term liabilities, not many short-term assets, and a lot of long-term assets. <coughs> This is going to create trouble for the mortgage lender to actually raise money either from lenders or investors. Or there's going to be regulatory restrictions. So a lot of mortgage lenders, again, if you think about banks, are going to have all sorts of restrictions on their ability to make loans. There are going to be all sorts of state and federal rules about the amount of risk that the lender can take on. What do these four factors mean? They mean essentially that there's a limit to how much money the mortgage lender can lend directly to mortgage borrowers. So what do you do? This is sort of the first step. This, this is sort of step one in the securitization process. Step two, you actually securitize these mortgages. What do I mean by securitization? You basically convert these income streams, the right to receive future payments from mortgage borrowers, into securities that can be sold to investors. How does that happen in the real world? Well, there's essentially two additional steps that basically happen simultaneously. The mortgage lender will pool together all of the mortgages and owns from various borrowers and sell them to what's called an SIV, a special investment vehicle. It's basically a shell company. A lot of them are located overseas in the Cayman Islands. I'll let you sort of come to your own conspiracy theories based on that. Um, <laughs> so basically, the mortgages are going to be sold to the special investment vehicle in exchange for cash. And uh, actually, a number of different mortgage lenders might do the same thing with the same special investment vehicle. Where is this money coming from? If it's a shell company, there is no money. What happens is, more or less simultaneously with these mortgages being sold to the special investment vehicle, the special investment vehicle issues securities to investors in exchange for cash. This cash is then used to purchase the mortgages from mortgage lenders. Um, This essentially means that the cash streams from the mortgages are going eventually to pay these investors. They are no longer sitting at the mortgage lender. They are no longer going to be on the, on the balance sheet of the mortgage lender. The mortgage lender is essentially going to have no more risk or no more reward from these um, mortgages with one exception, which I'll get to later. It also means that the credit risk of these mortgage borrowers not paying is essentially also going to be passed on to investors. So if these investors don't pay, these securities are, not also, are also not going to pay to investors. Why is this, why is this actually done? Well, let me focus on sort of what the interests are of various people involved. 
First of all, why do mortgage lenders do it? Well, they do it for the same reasons that I just, that I just talked about. One, they, get, they are able to unload risky assets and get them off their balance sheet in exchange for cash. Two, cash is a short-term asset. That helps them pay off their short-term liabilities. It helps for accounting treatment, right, because they no longer have this concentration of risk, they no longer have this mismatch. It also frees up that cash to be used for other investments or other loans that the mortgage lender can make that are permitted by regulations. So this process is good for mortgage lenders. Why do investors buy in this? Well, investors like these securities because this is essentially a very lucrative business. People have been lending money to homeowners for, again, for hundreds of years. Investors like to get a piece of that business. They like to, to get some of the profits from mortgage lending. But they don't like to take on all of the credit risk Right, to have that same problem that a mortgage lender would of having concentrations of credit risk. But if there's security, right, and there's many different investors, each one is only getting a tiny piece of the risk. They're only getting a tiny piece of the reward, but they're also not sort of putting all of their eggs in one basket. Um, at the same time, investors don't have to worry about actually going and collecting monthly payments from the mortgage borrowers. They don't have to worry about enforcing uh, their rights against mortgage borrowers. Why? Because they essentially pay the mortgage lender, who acts in the capacity of a servicer, to do those administrative tasks for them. Okay. So it's good for investors, it's good for mortgage lenders. This process is also good for, theoretically, it's very good for mortgage borrowers as well. Why? Because if the risk of the mortgage lender is lower, and the mortgage lender has more cash to lend out, that means that mortgage borrowers are going to get more mortgages. There's going to be more cash, there's going to be lower interest rates, there's going to be more borrowing. So this is, in some extent, a system. If there's enough investors here who are buying securities, there's more money that goes to mortgage lenders, less risk for mortgage lenders, more money, lower interest rates that go to mortgage borrowers. Okay. Now, obviously, where does a shell company come from, right? It doesn't just come out of the sky for, or just magically appear in the Cayman Islands. There's other people who are involved in this process, right? One group that's involved are underwriters. These are the investment banks in Wall Street that basically will help put together the deal They'll help identify investors who are interested in purchasing these securities, and they'll actually sell the securities from the shell company to the investors. Um, two, let me focus a little bit more on who these investors actually are. These investors of mortgage-backed securities are generally not individuals. They are institutions. They are banks. They are investment banks, they are insurance companies, they are pension funds, they are mutual funds, they are hedge funds. These investors, um, many of these investors, such as banks and insurance companies, are again subject to regulations in the types of investments that they can make. They cannot make they have all sorts of rules that say they cannot make super risky investments. So they have to be sure that these securities are more or less safe. 
How do they know that they're more or less safe? Well, they rely on rain So Moody's, Standard and Poor's, Fitch. These are all institutions that essentially look at these securities and give them a letter grade, which those of you who are students are pretty familiar with. A, B, C, except a little bit longer, it's triple A, double A, A plus, depending on the actual rating agency. These rating agencies are essentially paid for by the shell company with part of the proceeds from the, from the actual securities issuance. This will be an important fact later on that you might want to ask me about when you're talking about sort of what went wrong and what the regulatory fixes might be. But I guess some of you can already start to see that there might be a conflict of interest here. Um, now, if these, so rating agencies tell you what the securities are worth. But they don't actually in, they don't actually change the value or the risk of the securities. All they're doing is grading the securities. Now, if these mortgages and the cash streams from these mortgages are just flowing through to investors straight, these investors are are taking on the same risk that the mortgage lender is. That means that it's going to be too risky for banks and insurance companies to buy these securities. So what do you do? <coughs> One thing you do is you can, buy an, you can buy an insurance policy, or you can get a guarantee on these securities. <coughs> what happens is there's basically two types of entities out there. One are bond insurers. These are, are entities like MBIA, AMVAC, FSA. If you sort of see those names in the news, you know what I'm talking about. Or you have people who issue a straight up guarantee, like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. What essentially this means is, for, in exchange for money coming out of the deal, a bond insurer or a guarantor will say, if these securities don't pay when they're due, we will. Now, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have a special role in that they were set up by the US government. They have a congressional charter. Um, they are not sort of your standard state corporation. They're not a federal agency. They're sort of this weird, um, in between entity called a government sponsored entity. What they did is that they essentially would put these deals together. Some of the mortgage backed securities were essentially put together only by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. They were packaged so that the securities were bought, so sorry, the mortgages were bought from mortgage lenders, and the securities were sold to investors together with a Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae guarantee. The securities don't pay, we will. <coughs> Why did Fred, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae do this? Why did the government establish these two entities? Again, if this is part of a system, right, what we are doing is trying to lower the risk to mortgage lenders so that they lend more money to borrowers at lower rates to increase home ownership. That's what Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae's mission is all about, increasing home ownership by basically creating a securities market based on the mortgages that many of you have. Okay, so we have rating agencies, we have bond insurers, we have guarantors. Those bond, those bond insurance policies and the guarantees will basically mean that these securities have a higher credit rate, that they will be safer for the banks and the insurance companies to actually purchase. But that's not the only device that's used to make sure that the securities are more credit worthy, that they're less risky. So far, I just said that these are securities, they're generic securities. But actually, what these special uh, investment vehicles do is that they issue multiple classes of securities. <coughs> 
and they create what's called a waterfall structure or subordination. What that means is the S, uh, SMD will have issued different classes of security. Just to keep it simple, we'll call it class A, class B, and class C. What a waterfall structure means is that class A is going to be the senior security. There's going to be a rule in the legal documents that govern the securities that say that class A is going to be paid in full before class B gets anything. If there's enough money on any month or any quarter where class A is paid in its entirety, then, and only then, is class B paid. And then you would have another rule where class B would then get paid in full on that month in its entirety before class C gets anything. And only if there's excess cash does, does class C get any money at all. What this means essentially is that class A are safer security, class B are more risky, class C is the riskiest of all in this structure. What that then means because of a trade-off between risk and reward, that these are going to have a lower interest rate. Let's say these are 5%, these are going to be 15%, and these are going to pay a 20% interest. This tiering, this subordination, or this waterfall structure, essentially means that banks and insurance companies can buy these assets because they're safer and they get the rating of the rating agencies. They get an investment grade rating. Other investors who have less restrictions or more of an appetite can, for risk can buy securities that are more junior, that are riskier, but also pay at a much higher interest rate. Okay. So this is pretty complicated to begin with. But now I'm going to talk about step four. Step four is that these investors may still not be happy with the residual credit risk that remains on their securities. Even with bond insurance, even with these, the subordination, this waterfall structure, these investors still might not be happy with taking on that excess risk. So what do they do? They buy an insurance policy. But it is not really an insurance policy for legal purposes because of what we teach, of the types of skills that we teach at the law school. We don't call it an insurance policy because that would actually be regulated. But you buy what's called a credit default swap. And what that essentially means is the investors, basically the same people who are buying the securities, are going to pay money or a premium to a, def to a derivative counterparty or a swap counterparty. And in exchange, there's going to be a contractual arrangement. If these securities don't pay, or if the default happens, and there's going to be very specific language that talks about what a default actually is, we will pay you. Essentially, it is the same thing as an insurance contract, but it's not because of the way in which it's structured, the form in which it's structured, to make sure that it's not regulated. So then the investor might be, or might be hedged against the basic credit risk of the homeowners not paying in multiple ways. Now, are your heads swimming already? Could you explain that part again? <laughs> this, this part, the, the default swap? The, the investors, so I sort of 
let's pretend that this is the same guy, right? The investor is still holding some credit risk that these securities won't pay. And that credit risk ultimately comes from the fact that these mortgages won't pay. Now, the investor might not be comfortable with all the protections that it gets from a bond insurance policy, a guarantee, or from that waterfall structure. So what they do is they go out and they find each investor, if they're worried about this, will go and find out a counterparty somewhere in the world. It could be another bank, it could be an investment bank. Oftentimes, it's a hedge fund. And what happens is they enter into a contract. And it's exactly like an insurance contract in that it's, it's basically structured economically as, I will pay you money, right? In exchange, you will pay me if these securities don't pay. What that means is that the cre some of the credit risk is essentially pushed off on the counterparty. The counterparty is acting more or less as an insurance company. The reason that these counterparties essentially are, are most are not, not all of them are hedge funds, but most of them are hedge funds, is that if the risk is being pushed off on these counterparties, you need an unregulated entity to do this because even investment banks are going to have restrictions on the amount of risk that they can take on. So investment banks may be counterparties, but a lot of times it's going to be a hedge fund because a hedge fund is essentially an investor that is not subject to any federal securities, banking, other financial regulations. Okay, so let me stop here and ask if there's any questions on the basic structure. Yeah, okay. or they, uh, along with the bond interest, they're also some kind of insurers. Right, these are actually regulated insurance companies. They're regulated under state law. Regulation might be. Excuse me. Can you give an example of what uh, one regulation might be? Well, they're going to have regulation of actual um, insurance policies that they can underwrite. They're going to have regulations on the amount of equity that they have to have, or the amount of reserves that they have to have to cover expected losses. So if you talk about a bond insurer, they're going to have to measure what their expected losses are from all their insurance policies and have money put away, either in terms of cash or liquid securities or in terms of equity. Shareholders who are going to be at risk and are going to provide the cushion should the insurance policy, should the insurer have made bad calculations and have to pay out much more on their insurance policies than they expected. It's essentially the same thing that State Farm and Nationwide do for fire, for home insurance, for life insurance, except they're not paying out if someone dies or if a house burns down. They pay out if the securities don't pay out. Is that, um the payment expected to be the lump sum, or are the um, insurers allowed to just do it in the same kind of the payment basis as the mortgage? It, it can vary according to the actual to the actual insurance policy. And so, so the same thing with the counterparty, the same kind of right. I mean, the gavel is really going to be in the details of reading what the insurance policy says or what the swap documentation says. We just AIG in this. AIG is not your typical bond insurer. Where they got in trouble was they were a large counterparty to a lot of these crop credit default stocks. And you may ask yourself, well, I thought you just said that these counterparties are usually hedge funds and are usually less regulated. But what AIG basically did is they used an offshore entity headquartered in London to basically enter into a lot of these correct default swaps and take on more risk than 
the AIG entity that you would typically think of and you might buy an insurance policy from. So there's a lot of sort of legal formalism here that makes this makes a lot of this structure possible. Um, is it essential for the uh, entities that provide these credit default swaps to be unregulated or less regulated? It's not essential, right? I mean, you can have Lehman Brothers with also a credit counterparty. And Lehman Brothers is an investment bank. They were subject to SEC regulation, but because they were subject to some regulation that did limit the amount of risk that they could take on. So they could enter into lots of uh, credit default swaps, but if you really wanted to do something super risky or you wanted to get a better price, you could go to a hedge fund which was completely unregulated and didn't have to worry about what the SEC was going to say about the amount of risk that they were taking on. <coughs> Okay. Um, any more questions on the basic structure, or should I go? Let's go. So let's go to step. <coughs> this is step four. The credit default swap. Now let's go to step five to infinity. <laughs> These securities that were issued to investors were then themselves securitized many times over. What does this mean? Investors would then sell these securities. What do you call those securities? Um, well, these are actually the same securities, right? But they were then sold to a new SIV in exchange for new securities. And what this is often called is a CDO square. Has different names, a securitization, other securitization. There's different ways of thinking about it. What would happen is new investors would pay money for the new securities, which would be used by the SIV to purchase the old securities. Right? And you have the same structures that are repeated here as well, right? You have rating agencies, you have the potential for bond insurance contracts, you have guarantees, right? And then it can be repeated again, right? So I could draw here for several hours, right? how complicated it can get. Now the same thing is going to happen on the credit default swap side. Let's say AIG is a counterparty to a credit default swap with, who knows, the XYZ pension fund. AIG might not be happy with the amount of risk that they're taking on. So they might then enter into Another credit default swap <coughs> with a hedge fund, <coughs> right? That might enter into another credit default swap with Lehman Brothers, whoever. This process can be repeated and was repeated ad infinitum. Um, How far over is the regulations by the government? It depends entirely on sort of what, um, two things. There's going to be basic securities law anti-fraud regulation for the sale of these securities. But most of these securities, most, not, but not all of these securities, are not going to be registered with the SEC. So they're not going to have that full sort of thick annual statement, that thick package of disclosure. There's going to be some disclosure, but the main regulation is going to be anti-fraud. 
there's going to be some regulation of derivatives for the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. But it really depends on the exact terms and the way in which the securities or the derivatives are sold and what particular counterparty you're dealing with. A hedge fund is going to be subject to practically no regulation of a risk it takes on. A bank, like Bank of Albuquerque, will be subject to quite a bit more regulation. Okay, so I'll come back later on to sort of, if we get into Q&A, about my sort of take on where regulation fits in, where it might be going. Okay, so how did the crisis actually start? Part two, I'll speed up because I think I'm probably running over. Um, this process has been going on for, for um, 20 or more years, but primarily it started with plain vanilla mortgages, fixed rate 30 year mortgages. What happened is essentially in the last 10 years, more or less, mortgage lenders started marketing more exotic mortgages with funkier terms. One of the biggest examples of these exotic mortgages was something called an adjustable rate mortgage, or an arm. What does that mean? It means that the mortgage borrower is essentially offered a fixed rate, a teaser rate, for the first two years of the mortgage at a pretty low interest rate. Then after the two-year period was over, the interest rate would adjust to a market rate plus a couple of percentage points, or more than a couple of percentage points. What does that mean? Well, that means that these borrowers who, bought, who took out arms were essentially taking on what's called interest rate risk. So they were essentially gambling that interest rates would not go up, hot, would not spike in the next two years. What happened though, was that interest rates for most of the first part of this decade were at historic lows. So the people who took out the mortgages were either misinformed about the risk that they were taking on, that interest rates would actually go up. Some of them may have been bamboozled by mortgage brokers. Some of them, many of them, did not understand exactly what interest rate, what, how they were taking on interest rate risk. Some of them may have thought it doesn't matter because I'm going to sell my house for a profit in a very short period of time and I'm not taking on any risk. Right? And some of them might have said, who cares if I take on risk, I'll just walk away from the house. Right? And that's part of where the political debate is now in terms of what percentage, what, how do you explain sort of why these people, took, why mortgage borrowers took on too much risk? Who would, and we could talk a little bit on, later on, on who are we actually going to blame for people taking on interest rate risk that was inappropriate for their financial situation. So what happened? Historic, in, historically low interest rates began to rise throughout the decade. These arms, with their two-year teaser period, the teaser period ultimately expired. The interest rates then were reset to market rates. This caused a lot of these mortgage borrowers to be unable to make the payments when they were due. That meant that there were widespread defaults on the underlying mortgages. It became so bad that the defaults began to affect, began to translate into defaults on securities. First on the riskiest, riskier classes of it, of securities, and gradually on more senior classes of securities. 
this level, this wave of defaults was completely unexpected by the people who put together this structure. Actually, I essentially said completely unexpected, but we'll talk a little bit later. We'll talk in a minute about did people expect it or did they just take on too much risk? Um, what happened then is as these securities began to default, um, a lot of mortgage lenders who still held on to some mortgages began to slow down their borrowing. Okay? If the mortgage lenders were ha held on to some mortgages or were not able to unload mortgages quickly enough to special, uh, to special um, investment vehicles or investors, they got left holding the bag. That meant that they cut down on mortgage lending. This caused interest rates to start to go higher. What you saw was a feedback loop beginning to develop. As interest rates went up, that meant as more of these arms began to reset over time, the interest rates began to get higher and higher and higher. And this is the first of many feedback loops that can explain how the crisis actually developed. Um, so these investors began to suffer losses on their securities. This meant that in order to protect their balance sheet, in order to comply with regulations, they had to start selling some of the securities. They could not have too much risk being taken on by securities that were declining in value. But what happens is if enough investors are beginning to suffer losses on securities and everyone starts selling, the prices of these securities start going through the floor. Another feedback loop starts to develop. Uh, this meant that investors were less likely to buy new issuances of securities. This started to dry up the cash for mortgage lenders. That meant mortgage lenders couldn't lend more money. Interest rates started going up. Again, we have another and we have another input to the feedback loop. Um, a lot of the declines in the values of the assets held by these investors led to a crisis or a decline in the credit worthiness of these investors, right? So if this is an insurance company, a bank, an investment bank, whatever. Their, their assets on their balance sheet are suddenly worth a lot less. So there is a decline in their credit worthiness, both real and perceived, right? Because one of the things we see now is the perceptions about credit worthiness are just as important as actual credit worthiness. And it's actually very hard to distinguish between the two. So what happens if you have a decline in your, in your assets on your balance sheet? It means that you might, if you're subject to regulations, that you have to get more cash quickly. You have to sell more equity, right? And if everyone's trying to sell equity at the same time, you're going to have a hard time getting enough money for selling a lot of shares. It also means that people are going to start withdrawing funds from you. Investors are going to start selling your stock because they don't think that you're going you're, you're viable. Lenders are going to stop lending money to you because we're worried about the, the credit risk that they have in lending to you. There's going to be what are called margin calls, which is another form of credit being withdrawn from investors. This means that a lot of these investors are going to start entering into debt spirals. It's going to be so bad, it's going to start affecting a lot of the bond insurance companies and the guarantors like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Now, if this credit risk is starting to proceed in waves, ultimately, it's going to start affecting the swap counterparts. 
right? Because if these securities don't pay, the investor is going to go to the swap counterparty and say, pay up. But just like the insurance part, the insurance companies, if this swap counterparty miscalculated the risk or the likelihood that they were actually going to pay under this contract, they are not going to be able to make it. They're not going to be able to fulfill their obligations. And if they don't fulfill enough of their obligations, they go bankrupt. Which is part of the reason that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department were so concerned about AIG. Because AIG was a swap counterparty to enough other institutions out there in the world that they were worried that if AIG went bankrupt, that, it would, that the financial system would start to fall like dominoes. But Citibank, or just to pick a random name, or other XYZ investment bank, insurance fund, that had contractual, had, had correct default swaps with AIG, will also go bankrupt. Part of the calculation that we're told as to why Lehman Brothers wasn't bailed out was because they weren't party to as many credit default swaps. I don't know if that's true, that's just from the news accounts. Okay. Um, let me see, are there any questions so far? Maybe I should talk about take questions, and then if you have questions on sort of what my theories are, on what on is helping to explain this, um, or what I think regulation, what regulations ought to be put in place, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, I buy that the arms reset, but you're thinking that interest rates went up. Interest rates really have been very stable. They've been in the range of five to, I will give you even seven percent. But even if they went up a small amount, and I think that interest rates were, were, were pretty low right after 2001, 2002. But, you know, I don't want to quibble too much with how much interest rates went up. The bottom line is that the even if they are reset. The teaser resets. Right. But the general interest rates but the 30 year fixed interest rates have been in a very narrow range. Even now, they're in a very narrow range. So I, I don't think that you can credit the, if you say the 30 year fixed interest mortgage is the interest rate that that led to the bank. It's the, it's the on reset that I would agree with you could have triggered it. Okay, well I think we can we can disagree about sort of what the interest rates were, but I think if we're in agreement that the general that the teaser and the reset was one of the culprits, it might not be, you know, the low interest rates after the tech stock bubble and after two thousand one, we might disagree on sort of what interest rates actually were. But I, would, I think we can at least agree on that the teaser rate and the reset was a prime culprit. Because it's not just like, it's not just a prevailing interest rate that they were reset to, it's a prevailing interest rate plus two, three, four, five more percent. And that's sort of how the arms are structured. Yeah, two, two observations on the arms. Um, I'm not a mortgage specialist. I'm familiar with the arms just from my own experience. And the arm that I had actually had a cap on how much it could rise towards the market interest rate each year and over the lifetime of the loan. Now, that was back in the early 90s that may have changed since then. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure what happened there. But there is some interesting research that was done by economists at the Boston Federal Reserve Bank who have data for all of New England on all kinds of mortgages. And what they found is that based on the data, this is starting in the 90s, that our mortgages are no more likely to be defaulted on in the month or two months prior to resetting than in the month of the resetting than in the month after, a month after or two months after resetting. So, you know, it, at least that, that research based on data from 
through the 1990s up to maybe the tech bubble seems to suggest that that well, story doesn't fit here, but it may I, have changed since then. I think that there was a fundamental yeah. change, though, yeah. because when this started out, this started out basically with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae creating this, not only Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, but they were one of the prime drivers of this. And that meant that these, the mortgages that they were allowed <coughs> to, to buy and securitize were basically above a certain size. They had sort of caps. There was, they couldn't buy excessively large mortgages. They couldn't buy excessively risky mortgages. That meant it was basically this process was being used primarily for middle class um, mortgages of a certain credit risk. What happened for various <coughs> reasons was that this process was gradually expanded to more exotic mortgages, not just sort of your plain vanilla arm, but ones with much more um, riskier features. And they were increasingly marketed at lower income communities. Part of this was pressure put on Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and other parties involved to expand the, the types of mortgages that were eligible. Okay. Part of it was that the mortgage companies realized that, more, that all the other in investors in this process realized that they could make quite a bit more money by taking on more risk and by, by lending bodies to either low income groups or to with funkier features to middle class and even some um, wealthier individuals with probably much wilder features than what you have in your own 